Hi, everybody. Welcome to our channel, Our Scientology Stories, Peeling the Onion. My name is Mark Fisher, and uh, we're doing a live stream today. And also, we're going to be telling a, a great story uh, and with lots of information from a special guest. But before we get started here, I want to welcome my co-host, Janice Gillum Grady. Hi, Janice. Hey, everybody. Hi, Mark. <laughs> Hi, how's it going today? Hey, it's, it's going good. It's a good day. That's great. Anyway, uh, our story today is going to be about Scientology Anonymous and the Internet, and we have a special guest with us, and that is Mr. Mitch Brisker. Hi, hey guys, Mitch. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. It's great to be back. <laughs> Hi, Mitch. We enjoy yeah. having you with us. Yeah, it's always fun. Anyway, uh, just for our, our viewers, uh, the chat is open. If you have a question, you can put it in there. If you want to super chat us or super sticker us, please do so. Um, you can donate to the channel that way. Also, if you haven't subscribed yet to our channel, please do hit that subscribe button and uh, and hit click the like button too. You all know the drill on that. So uh, anyway, without further ado, I want to get started here. What we're going to do is uh, Mitch was involved in Scientology as the professional director uh, when the anonymous uh, group you know came about in 2008. So Mitch, why don't you do an introduction in terms of in terms of the story here? Well, okay, that pretty much covers my role. I mean, I, I once, once uh, Scientology's reputation really started to spiral out of control in the 90s, then I got pressed into service uh, to do some, try to do some positive damage control in terms of buffing the reputation. And, you know, the, the big moment we're talking about is February 10th, 2008, when, when over 7,000 people um, protested in over 100 cities across the world which nobody expected, nobody saw it coming. Uh, and, you know, alarm bells went off at the international base where I was working, and we sort of all gathered together to, you know, stare at this, like, this dumpster fire and, and kind of try to figure out how to do some damage control. But, you know, the story of how Scientology got there uh, it, it, and how it managed to have not just that reputation, but explode, explode that way on the internet. You know, it goes back to the nineties. Right. To, yeah. And I think, you know, a little bit about that, Mark, about that. Yeah. Well, it's, you know, it's, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. But we forget, you know, today it's 2023 and social media is a new thing. I mean, the anonymous phenomena, which broke out into worldwide protests in 2008, social media was a new thing. I mean, YouTube was like 2005. So it had only been a few years old. And so every, it all got going really in the early 90s, I mean, uh, and be, um, in, in the early 2000s. Before that, in the 90s, it was the most popular way of people, people interacting were, were these uh, forums. And so there was one, a news group forum. And, and some guy, what was his name? I, I, his name was... Was that uh, Arnie? No, 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 no. He, Arnie, he was involved. This guy's name was Scott Charles Gehring. And okay. he started, he started uh, all... He started um, alt religion Scientology as kind of a joke, uh, a place to sort of ridicule Scientology, and you know, it and was also a news people. Group. It was a news group, yeah, right? Yeah. It was a news group. I don't, I, I, you know, I'm sure a lot of your, I'm sure your audience are familiar with forums because there's a lot of forums. You know, there's forums for, you know, music and and I guess Reddit is kind of the big big forum of all times, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, so this was a news forum, and they would discuss Scientology. He kind of set it up to ridicule Scientology, but there was also kind of legitimate discussions about it, whether it was good or bad. Somebody, and I'm not sure who, if it was the guys who who got the uh, the confidential materials uh, in Denmark, right? Those guys who went yeah, in. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. right. Um, that was Robin yeah, they Scott. were stolen. They were stolen by a, actually somebody that we know who's a, no longer in Scientology. And right. actually went to went to prison in London for it, but uh, yeah, they went in. They posed as Sea Org missionaries and uh, demanded to, to get the the uh, OT materials. And then once they were gotten out, you know, I don't know how, but somehow they ended up on the internet. And well, that that was like the, basically the dam bursting as far as Scientology goes, because once you know what's on those confidential levels. You can't take that genie out of, you know, back, put them back in the bottle. I mean, it, no. it was on the Internet and, and you can't do anything about it. And so the secret was out. Yeah. Well, as far as I know, the first place they ended up was an alt religion dot Scientology. Yeah. Um, and 
the church responded as they do by sending in a bunch of lawyers to, to take them down. And uh, their claim was interesting. You know, the Scientology is, is often, uh, it, it's often accused of being a business and it says it's not. But it, the lawsuit that it filed against the guys who put it on the internet, they claimed that the confidential materials were unpublished trade secrets. So if you're not a business, <laughs> how can you call your scriptures trade secrets? Right. <laughs> Somebody, they need to explain that someday. But anyway, the point is they did all this stuff and that's when they first became recognized as a kind of very litigious, uh, uh, abnormal organization that would go to great lengths to try to protect itself. And of course, you know, it didn't work. It was a disaster. This stuff, it's all- They actually, ra they actually raided a couple of people's houses to get they their did, computers yeah. and everything. Yeah. Yeah, they did. Uh, I'm trying to think of their names. Arnie Lermer and Dennis Yeah, Lerner. right. Yes. Right. That's right. That's right. Uh, they got the courts to authorize them to go in and take them, take those things. Right. Yeah. I remember and that made it even that. worse. <laughs> yeah, because that then fed the internet with this information saying these guys, uh, I mean, the one thing the internet doesn't want, they don't want to be censored. You know, they don't like being behind a paywall. They've sort of come accustomed to that, that you got to pay for stuff. And um, I mean, you know, when newspapers started selling subscriptions on the internet, it was nobody would go for it. Now it's just kind of normal. Yeah. But I, I don't think people realize today that this, the acting to, to take your stuff off the internet is like, it, it's considered to be such an abnormal thing. But anyway, jumping forward, uh, the church started to recognize that they really had a bad reputation on the internet and they needed to do something about it. So what they did was, I think it was around 1995, they created this, uh, uh, the CD-ROMs. Do you remember this? I yeah, mean, yeah, I, I do. Yeah, I wasn't created, involved in Scientology, but I know what you're talking about. Yeah, so they created these CD-ROMs and they gave them out to Scientologists and they said, put this in your computer and it will guide you through setting up your own website because they thought, not incorrectly, but they thought if they began to grow a presence on the internet, a positive presence, that it would displace the negative presence, right? Uh, the only problem is, is that all of the sites that were created with the CD-ROM, they were like cookie cutter. They, they, you know, you had a choice of like four fonts and you had a choice of a couple of color schemes and some backgrounds, but for the most part, they all look the same. So the internet was laughing at this. Like if Scientology wanted to prove that its members are nothing but a bunch of robotic sheep, it couldn't have done a better job than mm -hmm. to have them all have them put out cookie cutter websites. Only a couple hundred of these ever showed up and unbeknownst to the Scientologists who were involved in this program, that CD-ROM disk that they put in their computer, it, without their knowing about it, it put filters on their computer to try to block out all the negative stuff. So right. this, it is, was, this is- Yeah, it was a police- uh, Yeah, it was, it was Scientology trying to create its own North Korean secret police state yeah. without its members knowing about it. Of course, it was a total disaster. It didn't work. Nobody went for it. Hardly any Scientologist did it. So that was their, uh, and so the internet just kind of sat there. Uh, you know, they just paid no attention to it from their, from their point of view until the Tom Cruise video um, done for the, you know, the International Association of Scientologists. I'm gonna show a couple of slides from that, okay? Yeah, go ahead. All right, so here, this is uh, at the International Association of Scientologists um, event, right? And David Miscavige presented Tom Cruise with the Freedom Medal of Valor, or I, I don't, do you have the details on that at all, Mitch? Uh, what they called it? Yeah, I don't remember. Uh, what I don't called. even remember. I mean, it's just so hyperbolic, all of the adjectives and the superlatives that they put on this thing. I mean, eventually they're going to run out of words and yeah. they're going to they're going to have to just start making them <laughs> up. Um, but yeah, he gave them this massive award. Uh, and, Tom, you know, Tom did this video and and. In terms of the context, uh, I mean, I, I this saw was the video here. That yeah, everybody knows right? this video. Yeah, everybody knows the video. Um, I saw the video being produced. I didn't have I was not involved in it because that was not do my you know who shot it or who was questioning him. Um, you know, I do, but I'm not going to say the name because they're connected to they're not in Scientology anymore. But OK, that's fine. they're connected to some people that I think it would be damaging for them uh, for their personal connections. But uh, it was essentially shot by uh, just the gold video crew. Um, yeah, so and it was, yeah, it was, I, I remember watching it being put together and editing and thinking, 
that he, his presentation, he, you know, he's been hanging out with Miscavige a lot. He, uh, they kind of have a lot of similarities personality-wise. Yeah. Uh, the people have Definitely. commented on that. But I never saw it more pointedly than in this video. Uh, but, you know, he, Tom, being a very skilled actor, he did this for that audience. Like, he played that audience, the, the Scientology audience. Like, this is what they wanted. This is perfect for them. But it was, and nobody imagined that it was going to end up in the Internet because in that context, it looked, you know, like he was a fanatic, like he was... Yeah, you know what I'm saying. I mean, I don't. Uh, enough people have described it. So yeah. uh, somebody leaks the thing out, and Scientology's reaction, as everybody knows, is they start demanding that it be taken down. Uh, and a lot of sites took the thing down. Some, like Gawker.com, they thought it was newsworthy, and they said, you know, we're going to leave it up there. We're not going right. to take it down. Right. Yeah, and it's kind of like it's like wildfire. Once it gets out there. You know, Scientology, like you said, their response was, oh, we're going to go after it legally and get it taken down. But the Internet is basically impossible to corral and control. I mean, it's 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 a free forum where people can put things up. And once it's up once, it can be copied in servers all over the world. And oh, yeah. Can well, you can you can through great uh, expense and trouble, you can positively affect your search results. But you can't ever get rid of stuff. Right. So and when you try to get rid of it, it amplifies the problem. You know, it's the Barbara Streisand effect. If anybody wants to look that up, they can if they don't know what it is. But it's essentially the if, the act of calling attention to something is the reason that everybody knows about it, not because it's on the Internet, but because you tried to stop it. That's right. why everybody knows about it. And so essentially that's what happened. So uh, their efforts to take it down resonated with a particular group of people who are engaged in what are known as the image boards on the internet. And the first image board was 4chan. Uh, it, was, it started in the early 2000s by some kid, I forget his name. Uh, and essentially image boards are anonymous forums where people can go and they can share interests in things like anime and video games and sports and movies and TV and whatever it is. They're sort of, they're sort of forums for the internet savvy, mostly young males. And um, you don't need an account on these, on, on these image boards. You can just go on and post anonymously. Uh -huh. So th that's where the name anonymous came from because everybody on these Im image boards signs them anonymously. Now that would be like the proper noun anonymous because you you're signing it as your name. So it'd be anonymous with a capital A. And that was the birth of anonymous with a capital A as opposed to the uh -huh. adjective anonymous. So the issue of Scientology came up uh, like, you know, the, the fact that they tried to get rid of the Tom Cruise video. So somebody, and I think it was just one guy, and we know who it is. I have his name is in my book. Um, I mean, he's admitted to it. One guy did this, this video. Uh, I think you might have a screenshot of it. I actually uh, but, don't. I don't. Okay, it, it was the message to Scientology. It was the original one, uh, you know, you know, with the electronic voice, Scientology. Yeah, the electronic voice saying. Yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna explain, we're gonna yeah. delete you from the internet, and we're yeah. gonna disassemble you because of all the horrible things you do. And it was essentially it was a prank pulled off by maybe one person, but all these other people who really don't like Scientology took hold of it. Now. To, it, this is to me is one of the most interesting things about the anonymous phenomena is just prior to their attack on Scientology, they had attacked Sony because a hacker had gone in and he had busted open a, a key that allowed uh, PlayStation users to use their their products on multiple devices. Uh -huh. So uh, Sony went after this guy and Anim Anonymous came to his defense and then they had huge, they attacked uh, Sony, but they did it on the internet with, you know, DDoS attacks, you know, uh, denial, distributed denial of service attacks, where you aim so many requests at a server that uh, essentially it shuts their server down. Um, but just note the fact that everything they did, they did on the internet. They didn't put on Guy Fox masks. They didn't go protest at Sony stores or Sony corporate offices because they have a manifesto that clearly states they do everything on the internet. They don't go out and protest. So to me that these, 
people went out and protested and called themselves anonymous. I, I was really perplexed by that. Like, I really wanted to understand why. And when I looked so into it, what happened then? Didn't they pick a date and had a protest? Or well, no. What happen? happened was there was a there was a battle between sort of these old guard guys on on 4chan and another one called 7-Eleven Chan. There was a battle because the old guard guys thought attacking Scientology was the stupidest thing they ever heard of, and the new guys wanted to do it. And so the new guys won out, right? And and they they did the same thing to the church that they'd done to Sony. They did the DDoS attacks. They did black faxes, you know, where you loop black yeah. construction paper into a fax and you fax it continuously. They did all these illegal things hidden in the internet. And then a guy named Mark Bunker put a video on YouTube that said, hey, I mean, I guess we should say who Mark Bunker is, right? I, right. I don't know. I don't know him personally, but he's a, like a regional broadcaster who has this vendetta to bring down Scientology. As a, he's like well, a social. He, he worked. He worked at the Lisa McPherson Trust uh, in Clearwater with Bob Minton, and uh, and he actually was a video producer. He had nothing to do with Scientology, but right. he got interested again when Lisa McPherson uh, that whole situation yeah. happened. But basically, he he'd been crusading crusading against Scientology since before. Right, but he was also nonviolent and and very. Oh yeah, know, yeah, no, no, no. Yeah. He, he, yeah. I mean, it's nothing. No, nothing against Mark. Yeah. Um, no, he was kind of a social justice warrior, and right. his particular battle that he chose with Scientology because he saw a lot of injustice, and as a journalist, he wanted to do something about it. So when he saw all the anonymous stuff going on online and, and the illegal activity, he basically put up a video and said, "You guys need to go out in the streets and protest because that's legal," and. If you don't do that, the police are going to shut you down. So all of these new people that had gotten into 4chan and become the quote unquote anonymous, they then started Project Chanology, which you know was a combination of the words Chan and Scientology. Uh -huh. They organized the protests. And then beyond that, you had this a, a, a pretty big group of people that had left Scientology and wanted to make Scientology accountable. And then they piled onto that thing because that thing gave them a platform. So you have to imagine that these couple of hackers, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, I'm gonna start showing some pictures of when oh, they okay. did these protests because yeah. it's happened all over the world. I mean, literally out of nowhere, all these people started showing well, up. Well, yeah, 100 cities, Yeah, it over 100 all cities. Fast. Yeah, but I yeah. mean, they were in front of Scientology organizations in Australia, London, New York, right. L.A., you name it, you know, and they just started protesting. And it was all these college age uh, kids and other people showing up and, uh, you know, and even you, yeah. it What's was that? a party. I mean, it, most of them, they, it was a party. They were a lot of them. They were just having fun. I mean, you had a lot of the the ex Scientology community that supported it because this was you know, this was a valid protest, but it was also a lot of kids showed up because they wanted to hang out. You know, maybe they'll get late. They wanted to eat cake and party and do it for the lulls and all that kind of stuff. So but my my point of saying all that is not to denigrate them. But the few guys that started this whole thing as a prank had no idea that they were playing with a book of matches in the forest, like in a gasoline soap forest, and it just exploded into a worldwide movement. So the fact of how it happened doesn't matter. The fact that it happened is what matters, because when that guy put that video on YouTube, that message of Scientology, like he had no idea that he was would touch so many people with his prank. You, do you get what I mean? Yeah, no, I get it. Well, and it the thing is, is that I, I want to just interject here, you know, mm -hmm. as just a public person at the time when it happened, of course, I'm a former Sea Org member and a former Scientologist, right? I started seeing these things popping up on YouTube and on the uh, internet and computer, and my jaw hit the ground. I couldn't believe yeah. how many people were out in front of these yeah. Scientology organizations, yeah. <laughs> and I didn't know anything about it. But it was like, are you kidding me? I even yeah. talked to uh, I even talked to the guy who was my friend, quote unquote, the spy for Scientology, and we started watching these videos and looking at them and go, holy smokes! I was like, it encouraged me. Like I went, hey, something's happening here. Like it was almost like uh, what later became 
you know, other movements like Me Too and Black Lives Matter. It's like yeah. for Scientologists, it was like, hey, something's happening here and people are paying attention. So it, it was quite something um, from my perspective. But what was Scientology? What was Miscavige's perspective at that time when this hit? Well, it, it, there was a lot of confusion. Uh -huh. um, Miscavige has always hated the Internet, and he still hates the Internet. Uh, he's never been able to do anything effective on the Internet. Um, his, uh, tactically, his reaction was to have myself and a few other people who tended, who, the media-centric people, we immediately went into the um, editing bays and started you know, doing tons of research, you know, we had like packs provided for us, uh, very slanted against anonymous. And we read all this material and then started making videos. I mean, we made, you know, they I mean, how did they get that material? I mean, what happened? What, what, what was the whole battle? Well, because they had PIs engaging with them. They, they uh -huh. probably, I would guess they, they spent more on private investigators during that time than on, on any other purpose. Um, and they just, you know, they had their OSA operatives gathering uh, uh, resources, a lot, a lot of which I didn't trust because I never thought a lot those people were very smart, right? Uh, so I did a lot of research myself. Uh -huh. I spent a lot of time, you know, penetrating the chance and posting anonymously and just trying to figure the whole thing out. But so we did a bunch of videos. Um, when the... Uh, here's a good example of the reaction. When the protests happened in Los Angeles, I think you have a picture of that, of you and Hedley. Yeah, I and do. That yeah. was from the one on L. Ron Hubbard Way, right? There were two yeah. there, right? Yep, and then we went over to the Hollywood Guarantee Building as well. I got motivated to, you know, because right. of the protests, myself and other former Scientologists, you can see right here in the middle photo is uh, Mark and Claire Headley. Right. Uh, that's right. Jenna Miscavige. Uh, um, who is uh, David Miscavige's niece, Tori Christman, and Maureen Volstead. And we all went and we, we were out protesting to show our support. The picture on the right is in front of the, the uh, Cedars complex on L. Ron Hubbard Way. And, uh, you know, it, it, we just thought these people deserve our support, so we showed up. But like you said, there were private investigators in there because they took pictures, which then later showed up years later on hate sites about me, right? And they all claimed that me and Jeff Hawkins were members of Anonymous, right? Which is ridiculous because it's not right. even a group, you know what I mean? It's just we well, went to show our yet. support, you know? Yeah, it's, more, it's ridiculous also because you'd never spent any time on any of the no. image boards no like you probably you guys probably didn't even know what it was i mean i remember that protest because i had all of the pi files and i was like oh there's my old friend mark headley because we had worked together yeah um so and anyway the, the picture on the top left just to point out people they don't see it the sign says mike rinder blue so can you because this is after <laughs> mike rinder blue but we had no idea where he was we just knew he was out yeah right <laughs> right so, um, yeah, they had PIs uh, even wearing masks yes. that, were, 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 that were, you know, in the crowd because what they were trying to do was uh, they had a lot of cops there because, you know, Scientology, especially in Hollywood, has this kind of strange, uh, you know, relationship with the police. Um, so there were a lot of cops there. And the idea was if you could find somebody doing something wrong, then you could go and out them. The cops could go over and get the guy's ID and they could start to find out who these things were because they were the people. They were obsessed with finding out who these people were. Right. Um, obviously, they knew Headley and a bunch of the guys, you know, but they weren't particularly trying to hide themselves because they didn't they didn't care. So, um, you know, we started getting this information about who they were. And like in one case, there, I remember this one. There was a guy who. Uh, kind of just joined in the whole thing. He had never been a Scientologist. He'd never really been part of the image boards. Uh, I, I, you know, he's just kind of one of these guys. It's like, yeah, this, this is a cool thing to do. We'll protest against the Church of Scientology. And this guy, we got this information that he had, that he worked, one of his jobs was he was a production manager in the adult film industry. So, um, and so they started investigating him and then they found out that he'd posted, this is before the protest on L. Ron Hubbard Way, 
he on his own personal blog he'd posted a picture of a of a gun of a 45 that he just bought nothing illegal about that it, it wasn't a threat it wasn't anything like that so they went and showed that to the police at the protest this picture and they said hey this guy posted a picture of a weapon on the internet and now he's here protesting they got the guy arrested and uh, you know he sat out the the protest in the back of a police car and i'm not sure how else they harassed him but he did I, I, this is in a you know let's just call this a disrelated unrelated incident but he took his life a couple of a weeks later after that happened um so yeah they were really trained these investigative forces at at anonymous uh and we kept making videos and so forth but i, I think the what really came, when it really came to a head was when uh, the, so that happened in February when the initial protests were, and then you know every March 13th you have the birthday celebration in Clearwater. And they, we knew that they were gonna uh, show up in force because they'd taken out a permit. You know, you, you do need a permit to, to, to protest like that, to keep it legal. So on the drive, uh, the, the way that the public would take to the event they had gotten a permit to protest there, and there was a major freak out. Uh, you know, I was pulled into a meeting. I mean, you have to understand, I mean, I'm not even saying this in my own defense, but I was not there to, to do things like that. I, I was a, to me, it was a huge distraction from what I was doing. I didn't like it. I thought they should have done nothing about Anonymous. I thought, it's kind of like the JDL do, does. You know, the Jews are really good about not paying any attention to their attackers unless it'll actually do some good, right? I mean, they're the original ones who started, you know, the, the Jewish Defense League, right? And I thought they should just do nothing. I, I, like, just pretend it's not even happening. Don't even pay attention to it because it's going to die out and everything's going to go back to normal. But, but you know, that's not Miscavige's style. He no, likes to he'll confront. No, he has an attack. He's going after it, right? Well, he, he only... He only yeah, Never he only knows how to go to war. Everything is a war. He, you know, even the IRS thing, what did he say at the end when he announced it? The war is over. Right. Yeah. Like, why did he call it a war even? It's just let stupid. Me, it wasn't a war. Let me uh, ask you, Mitch, what was his viewpoint, though? Like, when you, the first, do you remember, like, when you got, you guys, you said you had, like, almost like a, uh, in a conference room, people from OSA and, different people and you were involved in there too and yeah what, yeah i mean what was was he just like these i mean what was he like, was he like these mfers and blah 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 and you know what i mean or what, yeah what well was, i've never have you ever seen him any other way no, no. he was like <laughs> the veins were bursting in his fucking neck you know um i mean he had to unbutton his shirt like he'd pop a button um but mostly you know, he did this thing where, like, there was a bunch of us, me, and there was another pro that I worked with, and then, you know, Kristen uh, Catano, you know, from the, she's security chief pack, you know, Monique Ling, Ling, Yingling, and then another guy who's passed away, who was another one of the OG tax attorneys who was on the original IRS deal, was there, and then, you know, some OSA staff, and, and uh, we were all like, what are we going to do about the birthday event? Oh, you know, Anonymous is going to be there, and I'm like, who gives a fuck? They're there to it's their first amendment right just just ignore them and they'll go right. away and but of course we i couldn't propose that that's not a solution so i remember being in this meeting and i had to say something i'm the positive guy right so i'm, I'm not going to sit there and say well let's go kill all their pets or something like that i'm going to come up with a positive thing so I looked at the 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 location where the they were going to protest and i noticed that they were going to be standing in front of a very menacing looking chain link fence. And I said, why don't we, why don't we make a, why don't we cover that entire block of chain link fence with huge festive, a party banner that says happy birthday, Ron and balloons and ribbons. And then that way, all the photographs of them, it'll be apparent that they are crashing a birthday party, right? <laughs> Which, of course, was a stupid idea because they probably liked standing in front of that better. Well, but, and that's you know, the thing. I've seen some pictures I, when yeah. I was working for pictures of them saying, happy birthday, Ron. They're holding signs. But yeah. the other big thing was like, let's say we're going to eat cake after. Yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, so it kind of fell right into that, you know. Yeah. They'd have their yeah, signs they, about Scientology as a cult and all that, too. 
Yeah, the cake thing was a meme that came out of the image boards. Yeah. Because some of them were sort of, I don't know how to say this on you, on you on YouTube, but they they were fo focused on child stuff. Yeah. There were guys that were always being thrown off of there for child Yeah, I understand. Stuff. Yeah, so they needed a, a a euphemistic term for tasty young, you know. And the word was cake. That's where cake came from. Oh, so, I didn't know that. Yeah. No. A lot, well, a lot of the kids that were there protesting probably didn't know it either because this was some pretty intense, like, uh, yeah. internet, you know, internet subculture that it all sprang out of. So, but then Miscavige had this idea, which it really blew my mind. His idea was to send PIs to, they knew who a lot of these protesters were because they'd outed a bunch of them. And, he he suspected that a lot of them were young enough that they were still living with their parents. And so he wanted to send PIs to their homes and rat them out to their parents. Like, you know, oh imagine a, P, a PI shows up at your house and says, OK, your son, little Johnny, he's been protesting against the church of Scientology. And he actually thought that the parents would say, oh, my God, no, as opposed to saying, really? Well, I'm going to get bump up his allowance because I thought he was out smoking weed. And you're telling me he's exercising his First Amendment right to protest. <laughs> I mean, this was the stupidest idea in the world. I yeah. mean, you know, he uh, you know, he grew up in a chaotic family with a with an abusive father. And he joined the Sea Org when he was, I guess, I don't know, 16, I guess. 16. Yeah. And and so. He didn't understand anything about family dynamics. I mean, his own family, everybody in his own family pretty much, you know, abandoned him. His niece wrote a book about it. His father wrote a book about it eventually. So somehow all of a sudden he's an expert on family dynamics. And he thinks that the way to alter the course of the protest is to rat out the kids who are living to their parents, right? Yeah. Anyway, I was just sitting there thinking, you know, there's nothing I can say. I mean, I can't raise my hand and say uh, that's maybe the stupidest idea I've ever heard because, you know, you're going to basically, you know, these kids are all going to get like a bonus from their parents because, yeah. you know, it's clear water. So chances are their parents didn't like Scientology either. Right. So, were yeah, you, that was were you tasked. Were you tasked with doing any videos that went out or anything? I mean, look, well, no, I did your, initial videos. Your, like, what was your job? Like, what did you have to do? <laughs> well, I went in the, I wrote videos. I produced videos like on this guy who was a porn, uh, you know, uh, a the production manager. Gun. Yeah. Yeah. The guy with the gun, uh, various other people. I don't even remember who they are, but there were various other people that they were able to identify as uh, being, you know, ringleaders because, you know, you know, Dave always wants to find the guy in charge and then try to obliterate him. But, Anonymous, there was nobody in charge. You know, it's yeah. it's not like you could find a leader and then take them down because there was right. no leader. You know, um, I'll tell you something to jump forward a little bit. After the anonymous thing died down, the there was a concerted effort on the part of the church to actually have a real legitimate Internet presence, which, I mean, you know, their presence on the Internet in terms of the number of flashy pages is massive. In terms of having any kind of organic following or interaction with an audience, it's nothing, right? Uh, and the and the the aim of having a presence on the internet is to form a community around your your presence. I mean, that's what you do. That's why the internet's there. That's why you know people hire social media experts to to help them create a community around their product. So when we were in those early formative stages of doing that we hired one of the top um, SEO reputation management companies in the world. They're probably paying this guy hundred grand a month. Uh, and he came in and a few days, literally the same month as the protest, he showed up with a book, which I'm going to recommend everybody read. Uh, it's, it's by a guy named Clay Sharkey and it's, uh, it's called, here comes everybody, the power of organizing without organizations, which is what the internet is. And, and, and this guy came in and handed us this book and said, none of you will understand the internet until you read this book. And it's just stunning because it, it is the story of how the internet enables massive organizations to occur, massive organizing to occur without having an organization. And so he was always trying to 
confront or decode Anonymous as an organization, which it never was. It's one of the best examples of organizing without an organization, uh, because not only did it organize without an organization, but it did it without people even knowing who else was involved, which was pretty stunning. So there is. Well, I mean, if you say stunning, the other thing, too, is, I mean, they organized over the Internet and got thousands of people out. Scientology can barely get a 3000 people to a Scientology event. Yeah. You know what I mean? And they organically. You know what I mean? Just came together and started doing these. Right. Pretty amazing. Yeah, yeah. seven thousand people. I mean, it took it took. I don't know. Maybe Trump got that many protesters against him. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. It's you know, and and there was no violence. I mean, you know, in in all fairness, there was some instances of crazy people doing some things like you know some guy threw a hammer through a window of a church and yeah but i mean you're gonna get that that's gonna happen we there's no control over that yeah it is and and you know a few people went to prison but overall it was it was what it was i mean uh yeah go ahead in defense of the kid that threw the hammer into the into the window um not really defense of him i mean it was wrong to do that but he was not part of all that anonymous stuff he had no. a situation with his younger brother right. joining Scientology and not communicating, disconnecting from the whole family. Right. Yeah, right. No, it, it, exactly. And and yeah. that's often the case uh, with then somebody who goes crackpot. You find that they have a connection which was destructive to their own life. I'll tell you, one of the more interesting things that happened when I was living in Glendale, California at the time this happened, and uh, there was a small little mission uh, in Glendale and they had an anthrax scare during the time of the protests. Uh, an envelope, of, you know, a blank envelope full of white powder showed up, and there was a, really a massive uh, response in tr- from the, you know, the police and uh, and fire, and even like the FBI showed up. It was a big deal. It was on the news. Uh, I had my next door neighbor at the time was on the the uh, LAPD anti-terrorism squad. That you know, the guys who who foiled the the Al Qaeda attack on LAX, which then became, they turned their sights on Twin Towers. And this guy was real savvy and he, he caught wind of this, called me up and said, hey, I know you're a Scientologist and there's this, you know, this anthrax scare. Do you want us to send some protection to your home? But, uh, which I thought was ridiculous because it's like, I'm, I didn't consider myself a target. Scientology did. They thought, well, if they take out Mitch, then our entire film production arm will be shut down. So then, what's his name? Uh, the uh, from RTC, one of the execs from RTC put uh, private security on my house for a couple of days. Marty I got to tell you, no, Marty no, not Marty. Or... Uh, uh, Warren McShane. Warren McShane. Um, yeah, now Marty wouldn't give a shit. He's like, right. he's if there were if unless there was somebody he could go punch, he's not going to show up. Um, no, yeah. So Warren put some extra security on my house, but I think that they did that. I think that was a bomb scare that they called on themselves. Well, I that's what I was going to ask you. I mean, a, I, I, look, and I'm sure stuff happened, but it's also I. I mean, we know because OSA is not above, you know, below. They'll they'll do anything. Like they'll just just to get uh, a label oh, yeah, totally. on people saying they're terrorists. Uh, they're doing bomb scares. They're threatening people, and and you know, and they'll say that to get the police to investigate because then they can, PR wise, go. Yeah, we got these guys, and they're all terrorist group. But factually, yeah. I mean, there weren't that many people in the anonymous that ever got in any trouble. Not oh, like, no, 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 know, no, no. There were three people. Like, there was huh? exactly a total of three people yeah. that had legal problems. A couple of them went to jail, and it had nothing to do with anonymous. But, but it's not. It's not like the protest a couple of years ago where buildings were set on fire, and you know what I mean, and and federal courthouses were taken no. over. Portland and things like that. Yeah, you know? right. No, nothing like that. But, you know, an interesting thing is, you know, Scientology, uh, their obsession with victim blaming and with never being a victim. Yeah. Where, on the other hand, when it comes to them, they love crime. Oh, we're the victim. <laughs> we're the victim. So they were, when Anonymous happened, they were getting so much negative press for real things 
like you know like 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 ripping people off and incarcerating people and and break and mostly a disconnection of breaking up families i mean all of these things were indefensible because they were actually all happening and they didn't they didn't have very much stuff that they could they could say were the victims right so yeah. that's why i'm certain that they they did the anthrax scare themselves because that's just they got so much press like see see what this does yeah. because an anthrax uh, attack like that it wouldn't just affect them but it would potentially kill a lot of regular citizens in the neighborhood exactly. and i know the guy uh, people who who ran that mission and they were the kind of uh you know tools that would gladly call up the cops and say i found a white envelope and then because they got so much press out of that for being the victims of you know religious bigotry and all that so let me add, can I ask you a question except sure like around about the same stuff right were you around like like did you get any kind of public scientologist reactions to it like you know in the organization you know what i mean like i mean we know how miscavige and all them were reacting right but how about just a general public, what did they think of all these anonymous protesters out there? Well, I, I can tell you, I mean, I have a pretty good idea, even though I was isolated up at Gold yeah. most of the time, but um, the thinking inside the bubble is that the SPs are just, they're out of fuck, they're out of control. Right. Like, I don't think, I doubt that one Scientologist during that whole thing actually woke up and laughed. If they did, it's because they had uh, one foot and most of their body already out. Mm -hmm. Everybody thought, oh, this is why we need to donate more, work harder, work, you know, be better Scientologists. Uh, because look what happens if we don't. See, yeah. see, they have this thing, and you know this, you guys know this, that anytime something like that happens, it proves that you're doing the right thing because the universe hates sort of what Scientology is doing because the universe wants to be chaotic and it wants to be evil because of psychiatry. So if, if it's blowing up like that, then it means, yeah, we're really getting to them. We're got, we need to up our ante because look what's happening at our churches. If right, we you're talking were, about the public's viewpoint yeah. and Scientology. Yeah, viewpoint. absolutely. Yeah. I'm talking about yeah. the public Scientologist viewpoint right. be, because – Okay, so a cult can survive without a god, but it can't survive without a devil. And Scientology's devil is psychiatry. And so if you were doing if you're going along doing your thing and nobody's paying attention, um, you're not gonna just say, Well, this is great, it's business as usual. You're you're gonna you're you're gonna think you're ineffectual, right? Mm -hmm. But if you're trying to dismantle the status quo as Scientology is, if you're trying to get rid of psychiatry and, you know, make a new world without war, civilization or insanity, and all of a sudden a bunch of people get pissed off about that, to you, in a Scientology viewpoint, that convinces you that what you are doing is effective. So nobody went, oh, wow, look at the signs that they're holding. Aren't we terrible? Yeah, they went. They went. Oh wow, we're really getting somewhere. They're noticing us. So this is what, a basic. What eventually thing. happened? To, I mean, I can't remember why. Did, did it eventually just sort of fizzle out, or what happened over over time? Because you don't hear from anonymous anymore. Well, do no, you, what happened? You don't. It, you don't. Um, it goes back to the way that it started. It started as a prank. A bunch of college kids who basically wanted to get laid and eat cake jumped on board. And then what they didn't anticipate was all of the ex Scientology community and Scientology haters who wanted to uh, bring Scientology to justice would then amplify it even further. So a movement like that is doesn't have a very long attention span. And it just it basically just fizzled out. It, it literally like. If Scientology had done nothing, it probably would have fizzled out a few months sooner. But uh -huh. eventually it just fizzled out. And it also caused so much infighting inside the anonymous image board community uh, that it eventually, I mean, if you look them up today, anonymous, they did some, you know, they trolled ISIS and they've trolled Trump and they've done a few little things. They never took to the streets again. And they haven't like attacked any huge corporations. So that whole thing just fizzled out. Yeah, literally, well, they, I think anonymous 
<laughs> their taking on Scientology kind of destroyed them. Yeah, from from an exterior view now, I mean, it kind of like we've kind of built on that from, you know, the first protesting with Anonymous to then, you know, the Tampa Tribune's SP Times came out with the Truth Rundown in 2009. Right. And then Mike Rinder and Marty for a while were out and they started speaking out. And then Leah Remini's show and now all these YouTube channels. I mean, it's just sort of been, you know, exponentially getting more and more, um, you know, Viewpoints and yeah, I mean, the, yeah, I mean, the community that you guys are part of on YouTube and now that I'm a part of and that, you know, uh, Aaron Smith Levin, who has, you know, has kind of really helped to implement. I mean, this is the biggest nightmare you can imagine for Scientology, because after that anonymous thing, as I mentioned, when the church began spending all this money and all this time and all this, I mean, our focus for a few years was nothing but putting together Internet sites. And out of that, um, you know, Miscavige, that was a main influence of him deciding to uh, create Scientology media productions. I mean, there was another aspect of that, too, which was to produce events, uh, Scientology events away from gold because he never wanted them. There. Can you but, explain Scientology media productions for those who don't know what that is? Well, it's a broadcast facility in Los Angeles. Uh, it used to be KCET. Its history goes back to about 1918. Mm -hmm. uh, it was, I think, the original movie studio ever built in Hollywood, but it was kind of just a little little manufacturing plant that nobody ever c cared about. They made, like, silly little movies. Uh, but over the years, it was added onto and developed, and uh, Miscavige eventually bought it. And I think he, he spent, like, maybe $100 million renovating it. It's a really beautiful facility. Uh, technical... Techni Logically, it's very advanced, and then he paid the DirecTV, you know, ten million dollars for like a multi-year deal, a multi-year contract to have one channel on their network, uh, so he could say, you know, he has a TV station. But and then it, he started this this thing, and a lot of the we produced a lot of new material on it. I was there for a couple of years. I helped to launch it, um, but it doesn't really have an audience. Uh, you know, it's like. Uh, God, it's so I'm not sure how I can explain it, but you know everything that's on uh, Scientology TV is on YouTube. It's on yeah. the internet. It just yeah. it, you know it just it depends on how you deliver it, but because it it does have this one TV station, you know, like the big streaming services like HBO or Netflix or whoever, they're on every service. They have a channel on every service that you can rent that you can subscribe to. Scientology has has their stuff on one service, DirecTV. That's it, period. They're nowhere else. So if you don't have DirecTV, you can't watch it. But you can watch it on an app on your phone. Yeah. You know, and it's basically... Well, didn't you mention he, something about filling the vacuum? What did Ms. Gavage say about filling the yeah. vacuum? <laughs> well, okay, yeah. That's, that's, uh, that's a Hubbard thing, which he took on. Like, the, the concept is that the only reason there's so much bad stuff out there about Scientology is because there's a vacuum of information that Scientology has not done enough to tell its story. And so then the SPs will then fill that vacuum with negative stuff. So then his, his idea is you, you must fill the vacuum. So he basically blamed the entire internet fiasco on the fact that that vacuum hadn't been filled with the correct information, like mm -hmm. well, it was filled sense. with his evil activities. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, yeah, but you think he could see that? He couldn't see that. <laughs> right. No, no, he. It's just like the thing is, no matter what he's tried to do with with constructing uh, uh, this unbelievably complex uh, internet structure, which Scientology has. I mean, they have. A vast. I mean, I, they probably have. I'll bet you that the Church of Scientology has more pages on the internet, web pages on the internet, than any other company in the world. I'd be willing to put money on that because they have they have sites for all of their activities, for all of their so, quote unquote secular activities, for all of their churches, and on and on and on. But the problem is, is that you can't counter your reputation. If you're continually uh, f uh, f messing it up, right. you can't. There's no way you can do it. No, it's Im you, can't, it's you can't put lipstick on a pig. I mean, it's, it, you know, the thing is, the fact of the matter yeah. is, is Mike Rinder has shown that his blog gets more 
views or whatever in than Scientology's website by far. You know, yeah, absolutely. They, they can put out all the information they want about their good works, but if they're continually continuing to have families disconnect from each other, you know, disconnect, uh, you know, abuse, where's Shelly, all these missing people, how are you going to beat well, that by putting out this? Nobody's listening to that other stuff. You know what I mean? Right, but, but in DM's head, you never defend. You always right. attack. And that's why he won't do that and follow yeah. what they're supposed to do. Yeah. Are you guys familiar with uh, the uh, L. Ron Hubbard wrote an essay called My Only Defense for Having Lived? Did you ever read that? No, I say I again, know. My Only Defense it's, for what? It's called My Only Defense for Having Lived. No. It's probably the most self-reflective uh, piece of writing he ever did, where he wrote about himself, and he wrote about himself with with humility. It was I, don't, it was, I think he wrote it in the 80s. Uh, and if you read this, you, you, you kind of understand him a little better. I mean, he, and I'm not defending him at all, because he's also really polishing his reputation in this thing. But he talks about how he was just this mildly you know, a f famous person, just like my, like, and, and then all of a sudden he published a book and he became a villain. Uh, and so, and it's, you're, it's interesting, like just he, seeing L. Ron Hubbard refer to himself as a villain, even if it's, he's saying, well, I was a villain in somebody else's eyes. So I made, it's a, I really liked that piece. And when I was in and I made a film, I think it's the best thing I ever did. Uh, mm -hmm. It's probably a half hour film. I converted the essay into a film. And and I did it for the TV station, and Miscavige wouldn't release it, and he'll never release it because oh. it comes it comes too close to defending, as opposed to attacking. It's just borderline with Hubbard giving a defense. The title of it is my only defense for having lived, and he'll never release it because it's just like, you know, he doesn't you know he doesn't give a shit about what Hubbard said anyway because yeah. he's violating he's violating what he said to do all the time. Uh, you, but that doesn't matter to me because mostly what he said to do was a bunch of, you know, crazy shit. You didn't keep a copy of it? No, I didn't because I didn't know I would ever need to. And plus, I wasn't <laughs> supposed to take things off the base. Oh, you right. Know, so, and I didn't because it was like, you know, I didn't realize there would be a point where I didn't have access to it. But it's, it's um, yeah, it's like there it's the only thing that Hubbard ever did which came close to being defensive. And it made me kind of like him when I when I read the thing, you know, because he was I mean, it's got all the BS in it about, you know, his relationship with China and, you know, all that kind of spiritual stuff. But it's uh, anyway, it's just maybe someday they'll show it. But yeah. this fill a vacuum thing. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, I have to tell you something that I was I had a number of conversations with him about his ideas for setting up the station, the, the channel yeah. and um he felt that he had been treated so poorly by the press over the years that he he wanted his own channel so he could quote unquote fuck them up he actually thought by having his own media outlet he could then turn the tables on the people that had treated him unfairly what he considered unfairly in the press which is the most egotistical narcissistic notion in the world because that one could possibly have because right. in order to do that you'd have to have an audience and he doesn't have an audience that's right so you know it's like well, his, to me, his only audience are the, the the big whale donators that are still in there that he could say, hey, look, I got this beautiful, you know, TV channel and all that. Please keep contributing because we're getting the word out, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, that, marketing. yeah that you're yeah, that I mean, I witnessed that firsthand when we were getting the, the studio ready for launch on the station. I was not there. I was not there when they launched the station. I was yeah. back at Gold, but I was there when they opened the studio. And he got, he was, uh, I mean, I remember one day, man, he just lost his shit. And he's like, because it was running behind and he was really livid. And the thing that he referenced was the donors. He said, like, I got people that are expecting me to get this open. And they've spent a lot of money. And I was thinking, that's what this is all about? Yeah. I thought we were trying to save the world. You know, so, I, wonder, yeah. I wonder if he has blinders on about how society, non-Scientologists, perceive Scientology in him. Do you know what well, I mean? Well, I, th I think the fact that he wanted to send PIs to the protesters, the young protesters' homes, thinking that they would then 
would be happy, would, would be angry at their children. I think that shows a complete disconnect between how the culture uh, and families work and how, you know, his concept of the world is it? it's not so much blinders as there's no connection. There's no ability to perceive it. Um, yeah. So yeah, it, it's a delusional world. I mean, it's, it's like, it's like, yeah, he's living in a kind of delusion that is almost unfathomable for people like you and I, or especially people that have never been in Scientology, just unfathomable. It's just unthinkable that we could ever, ever operate that way, you know? So, so, well, so you, know, you know, and I mean, just real quick, one of the reasons that I got in so much trouble at SMP was I, I thought SMP was, I thought would, he really wanted to, to connect with the community and TV viewers. And so I had a, a lot of ideas uh, for things that would be, would focus outward, not inward. You know, there's there's a principle in Scientology. There's this be interesting and interested. Yeah. Right. Like you can be an auditor is supposed to be interested in the preclear, and right. the preclear is supposed to be interested in his own case. So something like Scientology media productions, for it to be uh, successful, it would have to be interested in the world. But what Miscavige has done is he's turned it into this machine that is turned back on itself, and it, it's only interested in itself. So all it does is run 24-7 infomercials about Scientology. Right. And people watch it for two minutes, I mean, and they're like, I'm not going to watch this shit. Yeah. You know, listen to you tell me how great you are. So, yeah, it's a total disaster. Yeah. And it has no audience but the whales, except that every season or every so often, they put out issues. I wish I had one of them. And... People are expected to take those issues, you know, study them, and then watch everything on the station. I mean, like Scientologists are like ordered to watch everything on there. Yeah, Jan, so, I have yeah. I went one other comment I was going to make before we uh, hear. Uh, you know, the other thing, the going back to what we first started on the internet, mm -hmm. right? When OT three was released and all the OT levels were released on the internet. Uh, a friend of mine who was, you know, used to be in, in Scientology in the Sea Org, Robert Vaughn Young, uh, mm -hmm. said he was he was one of the original old guard critics, you know, back right. in the early 90s, right? right. He right. said he said at that time, the Internet is going to be Scientology's Waterloo. And I asked him, I said, why? He goes, because once that genie's out of the bottle, you cannot put it back in, right? And one of the things that was attractive about Scientology before that was you could say, Oh yeah, we get people off drugs, and we're, we make them more able, and we do all this other stuff, right? Now all the stuff is out there, and it was compounded when the South Park episode happened, where right. they go, "This is what they believe," and all of a sudden everybody could make fun of it and actually go like, right. "What is this? And this is crazy!" And that image is almost impossible for him to to whitewash with whatever he does with his TV station, because that's out there. And that's what people know now about Scientology. It was always kept confidential before. Yeah, right. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, there's a, a very slick show on the Scientology channel uh, about uh, the preservation project, you know, the vaults in the ground where they put yeah. all the hovers. Yeah, yeah. I watched it actually because I wanted to see what they were doing. <laughs> yeah. And so when he made that, because I worked on the development of that thing, uh -huh. uh, develop, developing the script for it. And when he was making it, he was convinced. I may have said this before on your channel. I don't know that. But essentially what he said was when people see the trouble we go through to preserve our, our technology, they're going to know that we're just not some scam, right? And, you know, the, but the fact of the matter is people look at it and they think, nope, they think exactly that. You're not a scam. You are a doomsday cult that is completely unhinged and that spends, you know, millions of dollars sinking stuff in the ground that nobody's ever going to see again. Right. But he, would, he really thought that people would watch it and go, oh, wow, boy, was I wrong about Scientology. Wow. Yeah. So okay. it's, it's pretty stunning. Is there anything else but, you want to say about this subject? Well, I just, I just, yeah, yeah, I just want to make the point that uh, Scientology Media Productions has really grew out of that whole, pro, the whole ex war with the with the internet. That was it was supposed to counter that. I mean, that's where all of the internet operations are, and they have a, you know, there's a in the in the 
marketing division at Scientology Media Productions, you can, in one department of it, you can walk in and there's just this ginormous flat screen. It's at least 68, so it's, you know, like 65, 75 wow. inch flat screen. And on it, there's a graphic uh, of the, like a, a Mercator map of the world. And it represents every piece of internet activity going on worldwide that has anything to do with Scientology. Like you know, tweets, emails, you know, whatever, all the interaction globally. And um, if you switch that over from their portrayal of the interaction over to, let's say, the guys like you and Aaron and other people, in other words, the anti Scientology interaction all over the world, it would blow that flat screen up. Yeah. Compared to the activity that they're showing up. I mean, it would probably just turn white. It would just probably like not even be able to handle the signal. Because, you know, when you look at it the way they, they're portraying it, it's, it, it looks like, oh, look, there's a lot of activity all over the world. Uh, but, you know, that may have changed since I left. Cause, well, you know, it's funny. I've said to Janice, I said, we're at 5,500 subscribers. That's more than David Miscavige gets to an event at Flag. You know what I mean? And that's. Yeah. I, yeah. Now. It's it's really. Sad. I mean, the amount of trouble that they go through and the millions and millions of dollars that they spend to present themselves on the Internet and on TV to the world compared to the effect that it creates. Mm -hmm. Now, it's Mitch, I have a question. Do sure. they do, Hubbard was always very big on doing surveys to find out what the public want or where they're thinking at. Does DM... Do they do that at all, or is just based off of DM's whims as to uh, what he thinks? It's pretty much based on his whims. I know when yeah. the when I first went to this to SMP, we'll just call it, uh, and they were in developmental stages, so they had been like just, you know, renovating the place, but they'd also been bringing in all of these TV network bigwigs. I mean, like the guys who started the CW network for Warner Brothers and, you know, some real significant players, yeah. you know, a guy from NBC who had coined the term must see TV. He was one of the consultants and the, the and they also engaged in a, a company for great expense that did surveys, right? Like surveys where you're trying to understand, first of all, let me just say Hubbard's survey technology was junk. It was ridiculous. It was didn't yield positive the re, good results. They hired an outside company, and they would basically say, "Well, you know, who's your viewership? Okay, they're whatever, eighteen to thirty-five, and then they would start giving you information about the that cohort. Like, this is what your audience, this is what they like, this is what they don't like, blah blah blah. But see, then that has to be interpreted, right? And it was always interpreted as Miscavige thought it should be interpreted. Right. So that's that's where it falls apart because he's, you know, he's again, he's his mindset is, well, I'll send PIs to rat out the, their kids. Yeah. You know, his right. disconnect, his cultural disconnect is so vast that he's never going to be able to to decode that kind of survey information. I, I was you just reminded me of something I'd forgotten about for a long time when we were still in Scientology. I we was still in the Sea Organization around 1989, 1990. Um, uh, there was a book that L. Ron Hubbard uh, liked about marketing called Positioning. Positioning. Right. You may right. know about yeah. that. It was by a guy named yeah. Jack Trout and Al Reese. It was Reese. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They had a, they had an advertising firm, and they we actually hired them, and they actually came and did a briefing to all the Scientology executives. Right. But anyway. <laughs> They got hired to do a positioning campaign for Scientology or something like that. And it may have yeah. been Hill and Knowlton, which was the big PR firm in, in mm. DC. I may be misremembering yeah. this, but I remember the presentation after that was that if you guys want to change your image, you need to stop being a religion. That yeah. Was <laughs> yeah, that's going to fly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, it's just like, it, yeah, they think they have something that people want. Yeah. No, Apple computers has something people want. Yeah. You have something that you think you can force onto people. It's a very different thing. I mean, if people wanted Scientology, the uh, Sea Org members would be driving Porsches and BMWs. Yeah. 
that's right. <laughs> they wouldn't be starving to death. But I remember Hill and Knowlton, and I remember uh, the Trout, the, those guys. Yeah. I, I wasn't involved in that, but I, I, I went to a meeting when I went to D.C. with Miss Gavage for a sh- I shot him for, that's a whole other deal, but during the run-up to the IRS, the, nobody talks about this, but there was this fake grassroots movement called Citizens for an Alternative Tax System. Do you remember, oh, remember that? that. Yeah, sure. Remember CATS? Yeah. Right? And they were run out of OSA, and then they were run by Steve, what's his hell's his name? He's a Scientology lawyer who was the head of this thing. And yeah. I shot a video for a, a CATS <laughs> video where Miss Gavage was the spokesperson, and we went back to D.C., and uh, that's I have a bunch of stories about that. That's um, cool. But yeah, but whatever. Hill and Knowlton, they, they were the biggest PR company. Like you couldn't get a more prestigious PR company. But no. eventually they, they bailed out of Scientology because yeah. they're like, we can't. You guys are just, you're, you're a, it's such a mess that they were like, we can't, like, you know, we, we can't polish your reputation. Like right. it's just not possible. No, they, exactly. Yeah, it's just that they're like. Is there anything else you want to say on this before we go to questions? Because no, go to questions. people have questions about the different stuff we've yeah, talked okay. about. Okay, great. Hey, listen, uh, our viewers out there, if you've got a question, put it in the chat. Please write the word question in front of it. It makes it easy for us to spot. If you want to super chat us or super sticker us, we really appreciate it. Janice, are we ready to go? I'm going to go ahead and start uh, the questions. Yeah, I, I have started a few conversation pieces just for us to expand on it. I understand. Okay, okay. Great. Well, I'm going to go through first. I'm going to hit the super chats here. We got a few of these here. First one here is from Denver Stevo. Uh, thanks for the super stat, uh, Stevo. Uh, hello to my favorite onion people. Hi, Mitch. Thank you for your fresh views, thoughts, and stories uh, to this journey we call Scientology. Hey, what you drinking? They want to know what's in your in your. <laughs> um, I, in your here, <laughs> I have here black coffee with a little bit of raw sugar. And here I have some, uh, I have my own filtered water that I have disguised in this. It's just water. I'm drinking water. No vodka in there? No, I just got to stay hydrated. <laughs> Thanks, Denver, Steve-O. Yeah. Uh, let's go to the next one. But hey, gotta, uh, yeah. someday we'll have a drink, Denver, Steve-O. I'll there come down go. there. I'll come out there to visit Headley and we'll go have a there real drink. We got a super sticker here. Thank you so much for that. We appreciate that. And let's see what else we've got. Uh, here's uh, another uh, uh, super chat from COBILF. Bridge <laughs> publishes my only defense, but as part of some big series. I think they published the essay. The, the film has never been released. I think that's what they're referring to. Yes, you can find the essay amongst the published works. Okay, great. Thanks for that uh, super chat. Got another super chat from John. Thanks for speaking out, Mitch. Question for Mitch. Did you ever see DM beat anyone? Was there anyone else on the base who would beat staff with impunity? Uh, I never saw him physically touch somebody. I I did relay this one story about uh, him. How uh, One day I was on my way to dinner uh, during uh, July. It was like 120, uh, probably 110 degrees. And he had two men and a woman uh, execs. Uh, he had them basically sitting on the ground and the sidewalk must have been 120 degrees and he's like screaming at them. And it was, I'm sure it was painful for them both physically and uh, emotionally because it was, and plus it was being done in front of all of their their peers. Everybody was having to, be, having to walk by them to go to dinner. That was a turning point for me. That happened probably 15 years ago or 15 years mm-hmm. before I left. But that was a big turning point because I sort of, like, sort of, heard a lot of things i didn't know about the hole but i knew that jeff jeff uh, hawkins had had the shit beat out of him and I, or i'd heard allegedly blah 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 and so there was a lot of this sort of noise but i figured you know that's going on in the background and you know i'm busy we're doing good things and sure things get heated um but when i saw that is when i realized that anybody that's capable of doing that could be capable of doing everything that i had heard uh, allegedly done so yeah, that it, it's it. You don't have to see a lot. You really just need to see one good incidence of yeah, of, yeah and that it'll just like uh, yeah. Great, so you know, so yeah, and a lot of I've a lot of verbal abuse. I mean, I witness a lot, a lot of verbal abuse. 
Okay, John, thanks very much for that. We'll go to the next uh, comment. I love Mitch's voice. What's his accent, by the way? Anyone know? <laughs> yeah, I can tell you. Um, it's um, self-interested Laurel Canyon snob. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Great. Thank you for that question. Yeah, Selena. but thanks. And thanks. I don't know. I grew up in West Hollywood. I grew up in the Hollywood Hills. Uh, so I don't know. I just, you know. That's okay. You're not a Valley guy, right? No, 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 no. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it, it, we don't have anything against the Valley anymore because the Valley actually ended up being cool eventually. So <laughs> not okay. cool temperature wise, <laughs> but. All right, Jay Warren, I've always thought it was so strange how communistic Scientology, especially the Sea Org is, despite Hubbard being supposedly so anti-communist. Oh, my God. That is just, thank you for saying that. I wrote a passage in my book about how uh, how much, and I even discussed this with some Sea Org members, about how uh, on, on one hand, and the way that the Sea Org runs, it's a genderless meritocracy in other words you you rise on merit and gender doesn't matter right mm -hmm. correct uh ostensibly although i think uh, miscavige is a misogynist i mean oh absolutely yeah I, his favorite lawyer is a woman but that's not has nothing to do with her being a woman right um i'm sure he would he would prefer, maybe he likes that because you know they're supposed to be softer but um yeah, so you, but you, I've written about it. I mean, everybody's paid the same. Everybody receives the same punishment, the same reward, regardless of your job. Uh, all of the means of your production is owned by the organization, uh, and on and on and on. And these are all the exact bullet points of what a communist society is based on. Uh, yeah. And if, and if you, that wasn't my dog. Not my dog. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I, 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 yeah. Anyway. So yeah, it was. Um, yeah, it's pretty stunning. So, but okay. also, I, if you look at the the artwork, if you compare the artwork, a lot of stuff that I was doing, which is how I became aware of this. But if you look at the artwork, and you compare it with uh, like the Soviet realism of the period, it's if you swap out the workers, the heroic workers, for the heroic auditors and Sea members. It's the same mindset in terms of that artwork. Okay. Uh, Jay has another comment. A lot of the IAS events leaked. Was there any effort to take them down? The you know, videos? N no, I don't. I don't believe so. I mean, I wouldn't know anyway. I never I mean, was directly on that. Okay. Next um, question here. Probably not, because I mean, I think somebody watches YouTube. From OSA and anything that is a copyright violation or something, a use violation, they just get it taken down. Yeah. Okay, next thing here, a question or a comment uh, from A M Y P H. Uh, I have no illusions about Ron Miscavige Sr. was a perfect father, but I'm wondering about the abuse allegations from all the kids known before he blew and became fair game. I, I can answer that. And I would recommend... Uh, there was an interview done of Ron Miscavige Sr. with Megan Kelly, and she actually brings up how the church is accusing him of having abused his first wife, Loretta, that he always abused her. And he actually responds saying he didn't always abuse her, maybe once a month. So it's, he admits it himself of abusing, being abusive. Okay. Interesting. Thanks very much. Uh, next, we got Love Food Kitchen. Wasn't the kid with the hammer a Riesdorf? That was nothing to do with Anonymous and everything to do with a cult destroying his entire family. Yes, totally correct. Yeah, it, it I don't remember a, the exact story, but that does ring a bell. Well, Janice, Janice is, she knows the family, so she knows what's mm. what. what yeah, knows. it was uh, Brandon Riesdorf, and um, his younger brother had left and wouldn't communicate with him. And, and it did, it destroyed the family. And um, they, even the mother and father tried to get themselves back in good standing and do amends and go get set checked and pay off their freeloader debt. And that didn't resolve the issue. So it was all a big lie anyway, that if they did that, things would be okay. And it, it didn't happen. Okay, next question here. 
John and Jenny Gaines, uh, they did use somebody's typewriter and paper and sent themselves a bomb threat. Yes, oh. and that's, that was Paulette Cooper. And actually, Tony oh, yeah. Ortega wrote a whole book about all the geo ops and fair game they did on Paulette Cooper, who was a reporter. And, uh, oh, what was the name of that book? Um, oh, um, uh, the, the something Miss Lovely. Invincible Miss Lovely. Miss Lovely, yes. Yeah. Yeah, no, they, Scientology, that, that was the old Guardian's office in the 70s. Yeah. Yep. And, and I think it's also covered in uh, the other book by um, Broken Arrow or something like that. Merle Veneer. Yeah. Meryl Veneer wrote a whole book covering all the different stuff the GO was doing. Yep. Okay. Next, we got another comment. Love for Kitchen. Um, at Clearwater Cheryl, that's partly why I've never been public about my Anon stuff, partly because it's been so long, no one cares, LOL, and partly because back then they were trying to get anyone involved in jail. Uh, yeah, that's, that's what Mitch is talking about, the you know, they were trying to get whoever they could find and, and out them and, and take advantage of that. Okay. Next question here. Clearwater Cheryl, Miscavige has lived in such a tight little bubble his whole life, doesn't realize he's evil. I think he realizes he's evil. I just think he thinks that what he's doing is right. <laughs> well, yeah, I think I, he, go ahead, yeah, go ahead. Well, I think he has... Uh, I think he's severely narcissistic, and I think people that are narcissistic are filled with shame. And, I mean, I've had this on personal experience from interpersonal relationships I've had that went badly. But they're so full of shame, and they project the, those feelings on other people. So he thinks his own feelings of shame are coming from other people. Like when he left the base and then told me, I'm never coming back because there's so many people that fucked me over. He believes that, but he feels so much shame about, you know, I'm sure locking people up and beating them up that when he looks at those people, he feels bad. And then he thinks the emotions of feeling bad come from those people because he can't, that's what makes you a narcissist. You can't begin to comprehend or process your own shame. So I think he's in a in this very delusional world where he is uh, full of shame and he's reinterpreted the negativity of the shame as coming from other people. So uh, that's just uh, it's, I, anyway. That's my own my my personal observation from being around him and working with him for six years. I have mm -hmm. never ever once seen him say I'm sorry to anybody or <laughs> said I'm sorry about yeah. anything. I mean, anything. The only time that I ever heard about it happening is when somebody had the advantage over him. And that's a story in Jesse Prince's book, The Expert Witness, when he was removed from post and he went back to his room and got his guns and came back into Ms. Cabbage's <laughs> office and had his guns. And he said, OK, now who's in charge? Basically, he didn't say that word for word. And that's why, oh, no, Jesse, Jesse, no, we don't want to do that. You know what I mean? Same thing with Rathman when he left. Anybody who left blue, right? All of a sudden, oh, no, listen, come back, come back. Oh, yeah, no, I'll send you the free wins and you, you can, you know, you can take a sabbatical. We want you back. That's the only time I ever heard of him doing stuff like that. Right. Anyway. Well, I saw him apologize, just but just for administrative things. Like a, a few times, he'd rethought a reject and said, "You know, I thought about that, and you were right," or "You know, I'm sorry that blah blah blah." But it was only on sort of administrative things, yeah. not on. Um, you know, I'm really sorry I punched you in the face. I've never seen or heard of any kind of apology like that because it's. How about he, you, Dana? I'm sorry. Yeah, um, you know, I have a story when when. Dave had an asthma attack and my husband, Shelly came and woke him up at like three in the morning because she didn't know what to do. And so Paul got him to Loma Linda hospital. And it was after, after all his treatment and stuff, he had this realization and he said to Paul, I just realized power is assumed. And that had nothing to do with why he was there or anything. It was just 
through this, he just had this realization. <laughs> and from that point onwards is where I noticed he started changing and just climbing over and stepping on everybody to get to the top. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, we're all trying to change it. I mean, we're yeah. trying to clear the planet, right? Except we're trying to clear it of Scientology. <laughs> Okay, thanks for cl that, Clearwater Cheryl. We got the next one. John, Sea Org members watch Scientology TV every night, and he says in another comment, well, according to my sister who is in the Sea Org in Los Angeles. Yeah, I'm sure that that's correct. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, I know they're required to yeah. watch it, especially people who are uh, at orgs that are public-facing because yeah. they're expected to be able to talk about all the shows and so forth. All right, next question from Clearwater Cheryl. Don't they give the Sea Org a half hour on Sundays? Is that when they get to watch it? <laughs> how, how can you live without Bravo TV? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, what are we going to do without our 90-day, uh, you know, fiancé, right? Yeah, you know, they got Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. Yeah, and Real, Housewives. Real Housewives of, you know, Clearwater, uh, of, uh, of Flag Land Base. <laughs> that, would that would be, be really quite funny. quite something, actually. Yeah, yeah, it would be great. You, um, well, no, they get, I, I think that, you know, in a lot of, I know at Gold in the, in the birthing area, mm -hmm. uh, it's funny, they call it birthing, but they're, they never have births there, right? But um, they have common spaces that have large, that have, you know, TVs. So at night, if they got home early enough, like after post time, you could watch. I don't think there's anything else on there. So yeah. maybe, maybe just ESPN or something, but. So they would have time uh, uh, at night, I think, after after post to watch a little TV. And just to watch the Scientology channel. Well, they may have, yeah, because they, they have study orders. They all have to watch. They have to be very familiar with all of the program. Wow. Elements. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. Thanks, Clearwater Cheryl. Next question is from Michelle R. Uh, question, Mitch, do you think DM will scrap all your videos, et cetera, now that you are out? Well, if he does, I wish he'd send me a copy. <laughs> um, uh, I don't know. I don't know. He can if he wants. I don't care. I, I mean, I never. One of the reasons I'm doing this is a bunch of reasons. One of the reasons is to I want to. You know, it's reputation management. I like I like my name and the search results with the Scientology stuff to be pushed out, like the stuff I did for Ramos Gavage against him and so forth. The more of this I do, the more that stuff will get shoved out. But like the technical training films, um, my name's not on them. So, uh, it, you know, you're anonymous when you do, uh, that's kind of a funny pun, but uh, you're, you're, you do them completely anonymously. I mean, the credit on those films says, uh, written and directed by Golden Era Productions. Uh, and f because, you know, they never wanted a person to be identified with them because then the person becomes an expert on the technology. And because and, and, I had that happen, people who knew I did them, I was at Flag and somebody would start asking me questions like, well, it said this and it said this. And I'm like, no, 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 no. You just you go ask. You what know, about go ask uh, Mitch, the Directors Guild, did you have any issues with the Directors Guild in terms of credits and things like that or no? No, I didn't. I mean, I sort of did this. I'm a member of the Directors Guild and I sort of got away with doing this because it's like a religious thing. And, uh -huh. uh, but w credits, what, what, I don't know exactly what you mean. Like, No, I meant directed by Mitch Brisker, things like that. Uh, no, I mean, there, there were some things like... Uh, some of the public films, the Hubbard mandated that you should put the director's credit on it, but... I wasn't really there to get credit, and I don't have credits on any of the tech films. But even if they redo them, I mean, I change those films a lot. Not the content, uh, not the, the technical stuff, like not right. with a meter, but just I added uh, uh, title sequences, and I stylistically did things a certain way. And that's what the public is so used to saying, that it, even if they redo them, they're going to have to redo them like I had done them. So, and I don't, you know, if they redo, the, I mean, eventually they're going to redo them anyway. It was one of the reasons that I was so disenchanted working there is because I, I originally went up to help make the films quality and to help ensure that there would be staff to make films and then I could go away. Uh, they disagreed with me. They wanted to keep me working there until I was, you know, dead. Uh, so... I never expected to have like this legacy of Scientology films that would last forever. Uh, 
-hmm. You get what I'm saying? Like I, yeah, sure. I, I always expected them to be redone. So it's not, I'm, it's not some big disappointment. Yeah. Okay. But some of them are really, sure. uh, have some great stuff in it. I, I wish they I, I wish better. I could see them, Mitch, because I'm sure they're yeah. fantastic in terms of yeah. quality. I mean, I don't even, I don't even have stills from them. I have, yeah. I have I have one of the title sequences that I did because my my younger son was in it when he was five years old. But, uh, okay, but thanks yeah, for that so. question. Talk, talking about uh, redoing films, uh, my husband had been a star in one of the films as a course supervisor. Right. And they just finished the filming of it, and it was an editing, and we blew. We escaped. Right. <laughs> so... <laughs> They had to redo the whole thing, and that is when they decide to start hiring professional actors so that if a CEO member was in a film and he blew, they didn't have to redo it because they did not want Paul Grady on that screen after we left. <laughs> yeah, what film was that? I forgot. Do you I remember? don't remember what it was, but he was but, the But Mitch, it was movie. right around the time when you, when you came up because we left yeah. in 1990. Yeah. Oh, yes, they I don't were know. filming it early. Well, it may have even been. It may have even been the sets that you that you said had been sitting there for, you know, gathering dust. Yeah, no, because no, because no, that we remade that later just because it it, it the once the crew got their feet under them and knew how to make a decent film, then we redid it again just to make it look better. But we didn't redo that one because anybody blew or anything like that. It must have been done right before I got there, and then we redid it later because. Okay. Yeah, I think it was uh, early 1990. Yeah. Interesting. I don't know. Maybe I just don't remember, but that's all right. Yeah, I think I think it went like uh when I got there, they were hiring pros for leads because it was hard to find people in the base who could pull off a lead role, especially you know, a big role. And then they would use uh staff or extras and so forth. Then they started hiring pros, but but favoring Scientologists who were pros. Right. And and then and still using uh staff for for uh smaller parts. But then so many people caused problems, you know, like when Larry Anderson left, that really kicked it off. It's like no way that Scientologists are ever again yeah. going to star in any of these films. And you know, it's kind of tragic because you know, it's like the goal of Scientology is to bring on every man, woman, and child on earth, except the people that have been in the film. So <laughs> you know, it's like this rarefied group of people that like, oh, I can't go clearer because I was in a film. Right. I, I right. can't become but you know, it's not it's not only the Scientologists who left and spoke out. When I redid the the film that took place in Africa, uh, when the one that also Larry Anderson was in, when I redid that. The guy who replaced him was a very gifted actor. Who we found it. he was in San Francisco, and we needed to do some additional shooting with him. Like a year later, there were some changes in the e-meter and stuff, and we needed to re redo some shots. And the guy basically said, "Screw off! Uh, I won't work with you." Because by that time, he had become aware of so much of the of Scientology's bad reputation. Oh. Yeah. So it, it wasn't, you know, we didn't even have problems with that. You know, I'll tell you something. What is her name? You just reminded me. What is the girl's name? She's an ex-Mormon. She uh, has a, a, a channel called Cults to Consciousness. I can't think of her name. You know what I'm talking about? I don't know. No, mm -hmm. I know the channel, but I don't know her name. Okay, I'm going to write her an email because she said one day on, one of, on her channel that she had been to Golden Era Productions as an actress. Oh. You know, be before she, when she first came to LA and let, before she started the channel. Right. And I, 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 I got to bring her on and like do an interview with her about it. It wasn't with me. It was when I was there, but yeah. I, I never met her. So. All right. Um, let me bring up some of these other questions here. We've got this one here. Uh, Joan Michelson. Uh, I came in late. What is the name of the book Mitch refers to one he wrote most recently? What's the name of your book, Mitch? Oh, um, it's called uh, Scientology, The Great Big Lie, How I uh, Made an Evil Cult Look Good. If you go to my channel of the same name, the only thing on there is, uh, other than a playlist with your videos, there, I put a 15-second promo on there. So if you hit the notification bell and subscribe, you'll get an instant notification when I release it. Uh, but I think she might be referring to, I also mentioned uh, Clay Sharkey's book, uh, here comes everybody, the power yes. of or organizing without organizations. And I highly recommend that book because it's, uh, it's now, kind of like, it was handed to me, you won't, 
you know, in 2008, when the it was when it was released, is when the protests were going on. It was handed to me by a, a, a leading expert in inter internet uh, reputation management who said, "You'll never understand the internet until you read this book." And he's absolutely right. And it's just like Clay Shirky is amazing. It, it, every if you read one of his articles, poof, your mind will be blown. He's the, probably the foremost writer on new media. So anybody who's involved in this kind of thing needs to read that book. Okay. Now, do you so have be, any idea when your book will be published? I don't know. It's, I, as soon as I can get off the internet and finish it. <laughs> um, I'm hoping by the end of July it'll be okay. done. Okay, great. Yeah, because it's, it's uh, yeah, there's a lot of stuff in that book. and it's Yeah. Okay, great. Next question here. But thanks for Johnny, asking about it. I appreciate that. Yeah. Johnny, Jenny Gaines, question. This is Jenny. How much did you know Shelly? Um, I knew Shelly socially when I first went up there. We never interacted work-wise. Um, but I, I knew her socially pretty well in the early days when I was there in the 90s. I would see her a lot. Uh, I, you know, She's the way you guys describe her. She... Uh, She'd follow Miss Gavage around and do some damage control. Uh, she, you know, she was the kind of person that would try to, her, you know, would, would try to swash people's feelings after he brutalized them. Yeah. You know, un unlike his current girlfriend, his assistant, who follows him around, and when he brutalizes people, then she sticks around for a few minutes to make sure that they really thoroughly were brutalized. Uh, Shelley didn't really reflect Dave's personality, wouldn't you say? She she didn't I, I didn't she was, and I ran into her in 2008 so that yeah. a couple of years after she uh, accidentally I ran into her on my way driving up to Gold in a little town called Redlands so uh, and we had a nice short chat I didn't know she was missing yet so yeah okay great <laughs> you're the Thanks, only but... person who knew where she was <laughs> no yeah. absolutely not I was the only person that then said wait w wait a minute I ran into her. Yeah. In 2008, she was doing fine, and she was, like, having a, an afternoon lunch with her girlfriends. Um, but, you know, that's, you know, two years is a far cry from 17 years. So yeah. I, I don't think it had really settled in yet. I mean, it was such a non-thing that I wasn't even aware of it. Because, you know, you'd see people dis go, you'd see people disappear all the time in cold. They'd yeah. go off on missions. They get busted or the free or winds or whatever. Yeah, or what, yeah, they go all yeah. not seeing somebody for two years was not really a problem. I mean, finding out later that they were banished to a mountain count compound by the leader of the religion who took up with his assistant, um, that's pretty shocking. Or finding out that they're dead, like with Annie Tidman, where I hadn't seen her in a year and a half. And, and finally, somebody I kept asking, so what's going on with Annie? And finally, somebody said, ah. Uh, you know, sorry to tell you this, but she died. I'm like, why? I did, why did I not know this? This yeah, and person, you, why are they not doing memorial services to acknowledge these people and let those yeah. that are living and and cycle and you yeah, know. that's exactly the point. Especially the say goodbye point. Yes. You know, I felt robbed of the opportunity to say goodbye to somebody that I genuinely liked. Yeah. Um, right. You know, if. Maybe they did something internally. I don't know. I mean, uh, probably not. They uh, they usually do an issue, right? They do an issue that says, we wish them well along their way and look forward to welcoming them back. You know, they do that little issue thing. Yeah, but if, the, if the person's... We also, did, we also did memorial services for people. Yeah, I remember. Uh, yeah. Uh, which, yeah. And uh, with the Hubbard... Uh, uh, memorial, the whatever the, the the service that he wrote, um, you know, if there's celebrities like uh, Isaac Hayes, there was a huge memorial for him at Celebrity Center. I mean, there's probably a thousand people, wow. uh, and then there was, you know, they did a small thing for Kirsty. They kept that pretty private. I think Chick Corea, they did something for him. So if if their death is in the news, they'll definitely do something. When Tim Boyle passed away, who was the senior mixer up there that nobody's ever heard of outside of Scientology, but he, he was an important figure the last 10 years of his life at Gold as a sound mixer. And so what, about, was, what, about, what about when Annie Broker died? I mean, did they do anything to this? No, to this they, I, like I said, I didn't know about it for a year and a half. I know, uh, nobody, crazy. nobody told me she was in hospice in an apartment across the street from Celebrity Center. They have some staff housing apartments there. Yeah. And, you know, nobody was like, I used to hang out with this woman 
Yeah. When she, after she returned from blowing, the, when she blew to try to catch up with her ex-husband, uh, what's his name? Uh, Jim, Jim Logan. Logan. Jim Logan, yeah. So uh, after that point, when she came back and she worked her way back into CMO Gold, uh, we hung out a lot. She was on the set with us a lot. And uh, she was a friendly. I say friendly because, you know, we don't have friends. Scientologists yeah. don't have friends because there's nobody you can confide in. So, But she was a definite, strong, friendly person uh, that I felt a very strong connection with, even though I was completely unaware of her past with, you know, uh, with Pat Broker and so forth. I just didn't know about it. Because when I got there, nobody talked about that stuff. Right. Yeah. No, it was, it's the job of the chaplain to do services like that so right. that all the crew are informed and can say goodbye. Yeah, yeah it's supposed to be important. Yeah, okay, I mean, me this, I'll tell you, my experience with that real quick, my experience goes back, it goes back to Celebrity Center. When I first got in, you know, we talked about that. And there yeah. was a young woman, a young girl, a young mother who had a small child who worked in the kitchen. And, you know, I worked in the nursery and worked in the kitchen when I was getting off of drugs. So, you know, I interacted with her a lot. I really liked her. Uh, she was delightful. She was studying Scientology, living at the step. I was a new Sea Org member. And then she disappeared. And, uh, you know, I kept asking where she went. And I found out not that much later, a few weeks, that there was a, like an industrial sized stock pot of li boiling liquid on the stove. It fell over on her and she died of her injuries in a hospital. And but nobody said a word. And it's this thing that they consider it upsetting to tell somebody and that by giving somebody an upset, you're lowering their potential to survive. So when you give somebody upsetting news in their mindset, you're actually damaging the person. And so it becomes a criminal activity. So and and but it what it does is it makes them seem compliant in their I mean, like not compliant, but you know, the, the uh, like uh, they had something to do with the death, like they right. were somehow participated in it, uh, and it also, as you said, robs your opportunity to to just say goodbye to a yeah. person. So, okay, I'm gonna go to the next question here. We've got okay. just a few left. Uh, Purple Groovy sixty nine question, Janice, do you think that the circumstances about Shelley's mom's unaliving herself were very strange? Yes, I do agree that they were very strange, and I don't have details. I just have what I've heard, and it's definitely strange. Yeah. Okay. Next one here, Denver Stevo. Who's slacking? Smash, punch, and kill that like button. <laughs> <laughs> and subscribe. Is he talking about everyone on YouTube or like a specific well, Everybody one? in the chat. <laughs> Oh, Everyone yeah. who's watching to hit the like button and yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 We're going to change his name to uh, Cheerleader Denver Stevo. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Here's the next question. Here, Cal. Question. Hi guys. Happy to see you, Mitch. Nice to meet you. I'm wondering about former lives again and about exterior. Scientology tells members that there is different kinds of thetas. Did LRH write about? <sighs> I, I think they mean different kinds of thetans. I don't um, know. I don't, I, I, don't, I don't totally get the question. Uh, former lives again and about exterior. Well, I mean, that's... You know, that's the, about, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, that's the whole whole rationale behind... Um, uh, the, 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 when Scientology references spiritual awareness, they're, what they're talking about is the idea that you would become independent of your body at will and that you would gain an ability to have recall from lifetime to lifetime. There's this notion in Scientology that each time you die, you go through some process uh, where you then become, uh, you, 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 are, you become amnesia, uh, you, you develop amnesia about your, your past experiences. And so you come back each time with no memory of it. And I know I had discussions personally with Miscavige that he believed that he would achieve this, where you'd come back and you'd just pick up where you left off. I mean, it's ridiculous if you apply any kind of rational thinking to it. It's completely ridiculous. Um, did, did he ever speak about Hubbard coming back? I mean, I know they've spent millions of dollars on Bonnie View, the mansion up there. I mean, what did he tell people? I don't know. I never experienced him saying anything. I don't, I don't think, I think that was such 
just an, uh, an accepted fact. Once a fact becomes a really accepted fact, it's not really talked about anymore. Why talk about it? Yeah. You get what I'm saying? So, like, nobody's running around going, well, when Ron gets back, you know. Yeah. Right. I, I, well, I've never yeah, seen anything like that. His 21-year leave of absence is well past. <laughs> yeah, he's MIA. I, that's I, think right. that's, I think that's part of uh, Miss Gavage's uh, hysteria is that he's like, holy shit. Uh, what am I going to do about OT9 and 10? And, and, and Tom DeVock's gone. <laughs> he's not going to be able to help me write it. Yeah. I, I'm just going to that story where he... Uh, yeah, so, but, you know, when you're spending whatever, $50 million, $40 million building a house for him, you kind of don't have to say he's coming back. Yeah. Right? All right. I mean, uh, next question here is uh, from uh, John and Jenny Gaines. Question, Mitch, what is your book angle? Jenny can't wait. Well, it's about how I got in, in to Scientology, how I went to work for the church, what I did working for them. And it has a lot of my own observations about what that all means and how people get into that sort of situation and how I got out of it. So it's kind of, uh, you know, I survived addiction. I survived Scientology and, and I worked as an artist, a filmmaker. So it's, it's, it doesn't, it's not a particular angle. Like it's, it's kind of the whole thing, my story, but I, I tried to write it. I, I've written it so that it's about things, ideas. It's not about me. It's about all the things that happen to me, but it's about all the ideas behind them. You get what I'm saying? So, yeah. So. Okay. I'm going to go to the next question. This is going to be the last question we've got here. Okay. Uh, L. Ron Hubbard. L. Ron Hubbard's in the house. Question. What do you miss about your time in Scientology? Well, they want me to answer that? Well, I, I'll answer them. For me, I miss the people I worked with. And I, I, I actually miss having a common goal and purpose that we were helping mankind. And uh, I miss that probably the most anyway. Well, you still are helping mankind by helping to clear the planet of Scientology. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, I could say all of those things. I mean, you know, I had a, 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 a really a good livelihood. I had structure. I had community. But it, it's when you look back at those things, you go, yeah, I really miss that. You're you're kind of do, it's they're very self defeating ideas to have, <laughs> because you know it's reductionist thinking to think that you could isolate one thing and say I missed that, because in order to have that you had to sacrifice so much. So I I don't miss anything about it. Okay. Um, I you know I, I just I don't I mean yes there was there's people that I care about uh, and so forth. But I just I can't say that I miss it. Hey, you mentioned Maureen Bolster the other day. I had a I had a I heard from her. Yeah, yeah, we're in touch with yeah. her. Yeah, yeah, she was my video. I see. I got an amazing message from her about. Yeah. So anyway. Yeah, I saw her in uh, February when I went to Florida. I spent a little time with her. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. yeah she. I mean, for a, for maybe two years, she was the video assistant who recorded uh -huh. a video on this. But, so she sat next to me and and every day for hours and hours and hours. So, Great. Janice, do you want to answer the question too, or we should... You know, I always enjoyed the camaraderie while I was in there, and I'm there's a lot of people I miss, but there's also a lot of those people I had that relationship with that have left. So I still have that camaraderie yeah. with yeah. people now that they're on the outside. You know? Yeah, I, I I just can't help thinking about what I had to give up in order to have anything positive. So I just it's hard to say. Yeah, I missed something. I understand. Okay. Well, anyway, that's that's the end of our uh, Q and A here. I wanted to put this up. You can watch our previous interviews with Mitch. Uh, the one in the on the left in the red that was the first one, and then we did a live viewer uh, question and answer on the second one. Uh, and a lot of people have watched them, but if you haven't seen them, please go ahead and. Uh, they're on our channel. You can find them and, and watch them. And uh, do you guys have anything else you would like to say, Mitch, uh, before we end off? Mitch, do you yes. have anything to say? Oh, yeah. So, um, no, I'm good. I really appreciate seeing you guys again. Uh, yep. You know, I always think we're going to be maybe an hour or something. And we get so 
t- caught up <laughs> in our experience and so forth. We have no, lots you've of- got valuable information, Mitch. Your stories are great. Everybody yeah, and appreciate I, what you're saying. I, oh, thank you. Uh, you're very welcome. You know, I do want to end with one thing. One of the things that's happened since I started speaking out was um, almost immediately, I had a couple of people reach out to me who asked me, "Oh, you worked at Gold? Do you know my parents? Oh, you worked there? Do you know my so and so? Oh, you?" And I, it's just such uh, a, an affirmation of for my having spoken, you know, speaking out because it's like, what kind of an organization I was working for? It was like if you escape from East Germany, people would come to you and they'd say, "Oh, do you know my? Did you know my?" You know, it really is so stunning. And then I had another person reach out to me who was uh, had been 16 years old. She had a cocaine habit. Her parents put her in a, a rehab that turned out to be a cult where she was sexually molested. Ooh. And and she has a number of other people that went through the same experience. And she's telling me about how they watch all of the Scientology stuff because they're too small a group to have a platform Mm -hmm. and how much it helps them. So it made me realize that it's not just us who are in Scientology, but there's a lot of people out there that have escaped abuse and are still recovering from abuse. And they're looking to this community for help and support. Just hearing the stories. She said to me, Scientology, same story, different day. And I was just like, wow, that, that really kind of blew my mind. Fabulous. Okay. Um, I, I want to end with something, and that okay. is um, I want to thank people for helping with – I'm looking for Andrew Barton, and a lot of people have come forward with some leads on that, and we're pulling that down. But it gave me an idea, and what I'm going to do every Saturday is I'm going to do a small segment on missing or people who are out of communication with their family. And – L. Ron Hubbard came up with a world out of calm, and he did a whole program called Wook. Well, my segment is going to be called Sea Org out of calm, because the Sea Org members, how can they get the, the world in communication if they themselves are not in communication with their own family and friends, and they're disconnected, not seen for 20, 40 years? They're out of touch with them. So how do they expect to help the world? They need to start with themselves in their own backyard. So my segment will be Sea Org Out of Calm. And I will start calling out individual Sea Org members that I know have been out of touch with their families and anyone else who needs help and wants to expose and call out people that are in the Sea Org, then write to me at JaniceGillumGrady at gmail.com and I will start calling them out. Okay. Yes. That's great, Janice. Okay, one last thing I got to say is please subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. And if you have any questions that we didn't answer, go ahead and ask them in the comment section and uh, we will get to them. Janice and I will answer them. And Mitch, I want to thank you again. Uh, you know, we enjoy talking with you. You're, you're, a, uh, you're just a pleasant, very, very nice person to talk to. You've got <laughs> thank tremendous you very much. And yeah, uh, we, enjoy we it. really, really enjoy it. I appreciate that. And likewise, it's great, great being here with you guys. Anytime. Right. All right. Thanks, so, Mitch. Until next time, we'll see you all later. Bye. Yeah, take, take care. Okay, I'm not live anymore. Sorry that took so long. <laughs>